Guess what intern is out in the field for the new Chex Daily? <laughs> Well, it's a beautiful day to be out on the water, and that's what we'll be doing today. I'm Francis Thoreau, and I'm taking my first tour of the Liftlock Cruises. We're on the Skylark 8, and Captain Grant's going to be showing us around. Stick with us. we got more coming up on the new Chex Daily. Now, despite the fact the course may still need some work, conditions like this in Syracuse are so rare that golfers, including myself, have come out to take a couple swings. In 1915, the Manlius Library was just a reading room in the basement of a church. 100 years later, there's so much more, and on this Saturday, they're celebrating how far they've come. Salcido said his injury that kept him off the field made him appreciate every minute he gets to play now. But one of his former teammates made him realize how precious every minute can be. Small Business Saturday is the day after Black Friday, a day typically where people go to large stores to buy discounted items. But on days like Small Business Saturday, Freedom of Espresso gets a break from their competitors such as Starbucks. The American Cancer Society will be holding events throughout the month of October, and they are still looking for volunteers. Reporting live from East Syracuse, Francis Surwa, NCC News. Most people's issues with winter come from the cold and the snow. However, it's actually the lack of sunlight that causes seasonal depression. The shorter days release melatonin in the brain, which causes people to feel symptoms of anxiety, loneliness, and depression during the winter months. The U.S. presidential election moves to South Carolina this week. A new poll released by CBS finds Donald Trump continues to hold a commanding lead in the Republican primary race. The CBS results come a day after the Wall Street Journal poll showed Cruz with a slight lead over Trump. You may be feeling a little blue during the winter months. This feeling could be more serious than you'd think. Seasonal depression can affect people even during mild winters like the one we're currently going through. I took a closer look at who is most at risk and what is being done to help. And I'm Francis Surwa, a longtime political reporter with decades of experience, tells NCC News that the biggest reason for Sanders' rise is because he's capturing the voters' enthusiasm for a political revolution. Fire crews had to get on top of the roof to keep the flames from spreading, and officials say they were able to keep the fire under control, and the majority of the damage was done on the China Garden and the two surrounding stores. The cause of the fire is still under investigation. Francis, how will this new coach change the team? What should SU fans expect? Well, Syracuse is uh, coming off a defensive-minded coach. Scott Schaefer was a defensive coordinator first, and then he implemented that system. And Syracuse had played really good defense the past couple of years, although this year it should be complete overhaul. Babers is an offensive-minded coach. While at Bowling Green last year, they had four games where they scored more than 30 points, and it should be a high-powered, fast-paced offense. And Francis, uh, what players in particular do you think will benefit the most from this coaching change? Well, I look at the young mobile quarterback in Eric Dungy. Uh, before Bowling Green, Babers uh, coached RG3 at Baylor. I'm not going to say they have similar career paths, but he was able to uh, work with him and, and create a Heisman caliber quarterback. Uh, Dungy's mobile, he's fast, he's confident. So I look to see him really improve come the following season. I'm going to throw one more at you. Uh, do you think this was the right move? And if so, why? I think it was a great move. Uh, Syracuse really needed to shake things up. They have a good program, and now with Babers, they have a lot more uh, recruiting power. He's been very good at turning programs around by bringing high-quality players into the program and really building it up and developing them through the system. Scoring goals for the Orange is something Sergio Salcido has gotten used to this season. In his fourth year at Syracuse, he leads all midfielders with 19 goals. However, his path to lacrosse success took a turn for the worse during his freshman year. Salcido tore both his MCL and ACL during the team's first practice. Despite the setback, he says the opportunity to start this year has been worth the work. You know, kind of moving my way up the ranks each year was tough and tough because, you know, I, I felt like I could be playing and contributing for so long, but I was just kind of waiting to get my chance. And, you know, now that it's kind of in my hands, you know, I'm like, willing to do whatever I can to just, you know, grasp it and, you know, capture the moment. Salcido said his injury that kept him off the field made him appreciate every minute he gets to play now. But one of his former teammates made him realize how precious every minute can be. On December 14th, John Michael Knight suffered a devastating stroke, leaving him with locked-in syndrome, a condition that paralyzes the muscles in his body but leaves his mental capacity intact. Weeks before his stroke, the 17-year-old signed a scholarship to play lacrosse at the collegiate level. Athletes across the country, including Salcedo, have been using the hashtag JMStrong to share his story. People supporting him and stepping up and, you know, being there for him, even if they don't even know him directly, shows that, you know, he's made a huge impact. And when he looks back at the end of all this, you know, hopefully, you know, in full health, that, 
you know, he'll, he'll smile and say, you know, I touched a lot of people during that time. Their support has gone viral, with J.M. Strong appearing in more and more places, including the cover of the lacrosse video game. Salcido believes John Michael's story is one that everyone can learn from. You know, things can be taken from you any second, whether it's something like having a stroke, like he had, or even tearing my ACL, you know, it's not like something you have planned. Life knocks you down, always get up and, you know, fight harder and, you know, just never give up on your dreams. Reporting from Syracuse, Francis Serwa, NCC News. In Syria, rape and killings are becoming part of the culture. Overshadowed by the refugee crisis in the war-torn country, sexual misconduct has gone uncovered. Today at Syracuse University, a team of researchers is putting a spotlight on the issue. 30 law students have worked with Syrian news sources, non-government organizations, and the United Nations over the past seven years. The result? A paper analyzing the atrocities taking place in the Middle East. Peter Levrant is the executive director of the project and says the nature of sexual assault makes it difficult to quantify. We've called the paper a snapshot analysis because it is very limited in scope. Current estimates right now are between 5,000 and uh, 50,000 incidents of rape in Syria, but it's such an underreported crime just given the political and social ramifications of even reporting rape in, in the country and in general across the world that there's only so much that can be actually reported. The paper shows that more than 450 women have been affected by the assaults, with the main perpetrators being the Syrian regime. However, the goal of this event is not to point fingers, but to establish a justice system that protects women in the Middle East. The majority of documented rapes occurred while the victim was detained or imprisoned. Assault during home raids was common as well. Molly White is the chief registrar and is responsible for trend analysis. She says the number of rapes and other war crimes committed in Syria needs to be brought to the forefront. It's been over a quarter of a million deaths. There are millions of refugees inside the country and outside of Syria. Um, it's just the numbers are absolutely staggering. Along with the publishing of the paper, the event included speakers, a gallery of international pictures of the year, and a virtual reality simulator that gave people a glimpse into the conditions of Syria. The paper called the Syrian Accountability Project will be distributed to the United Nations and other international legal organizations. Reporting live from the newsroom, Francis Serwa, NCC News. The Drumlands Golf Course is not officially open until April 1st. However, with temperatures in the mid-60s, they've opened their doors to golfers who want to get an early start on the season. It's the sound that every golfer dreams of. The first swing of spring. Despite the mild weather, golf courses like Drumlands and DeWitt still have plenty of work to do. This includes drying out water left behind by snow, removing debris from the fairways, and touching up the clubhouse. Sean Deity says this is the earliest start he's seen in his eight years of being the course's head golf professional. We don't budget for staff for help to start collecting greens fees, to police the golf course, uh, in, the same, in the same breath putting the tee markers out, the benches, the trash cans. This is great that you know, people are able to come out right now, but budgetary, we don't really plan on people playing in March. Now, despite the fact the course may still need some work, conditions like this in Syracuse are so rare that golfers, including myself, have come out to take a couple swings. More than 20 golfers came out today to either play around or practice their short game. Everyone on the course had a similar message. They were thankful for the fortunate weather. Well, anytime you can get out and play golf in March in Syracuse, it's a bonus. This is one of those special years where we can actually get in a round of golf every month of the year. After last year's brutal winter, the course opened on April 1st but was not fit for play. This year, however, by opening day, everything will be up to par. Reporting from DeWitt, Francis Serwa, NCC News.